Thank you. Thank you so much. So this was a very uh, simple video that we were also sharing on all our uh, timelines. So firstly, a very, very warm welcome to everyone. The, my name is Vijayata Shastri. I'm the Executive Director of Type Bangalore. And uh, yes, uh, some important and essential conversations today. Uh, it's about uh, startups, it's about innovation, it's about climate change. Uh, but first, it gives me an honor to quickly talk about Type Bangalore, and I would also like to give a shout out to Mr. T. R. Anand, who's part of the uh, Type Bangalore uh, community and uh, board member, and as well as a co-chair of the IoT Forum. So at Type Bangalore, we focus on very simple things: how can we foster entrepreneurship? How can we support the ecosystem of uh, startups, founders, and innovators? How can we help them to grow, get their funding, get their mentoring, and of course, create these kind of wonderful programs? where they can interact with thought leaders, they can interact with the finest people across the innovation cluster of academia, of investors, of thought leaders. And the IoT Forum has been formed to focus on improving and increasing the IoT quotient in India. Of course, it has been a very global play for us. And we have had many people from all across the world taking part. Again, the, the focus is what can we do for the entrepreneurs, the innovators? How can we bring people together and you know make the startup ecosystem super duper vibrant? With that, I would also now like to invite Abhishek. He's from Caspian and he's going to be setting the context of what is going to be expectations that we will have today. And yes, a warm thank you and welcome to every single one of the other panel members and the audience who have joined us in. All right, so Abhishek, over to you, sir. And I'm going off video and audio because we are all students and I'm here to also learn about what's going on. So thank you, Abhishek. Over to you, sir. Cheers. Thank you, Vijeta. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this session here today. Uh, a, a very warm welcome. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a background, once again, uh, like Vijeta mentioned, uh, uh, I am from Caspian Debt. And Caspian Debt is one of the largest providers of custom debt financing uh, to startups and social enterprises in India. We've funded a little more than 160 companies till date. And the interesting thing is that uh, about 50 of them, uh, 50 of the startups and social enterprises that we have funded, which includes companies in the uh, food and agribusiness and ag tech space, uh, have direct impact or are, uh, in fact, directly impacted by climate change. Uh, so the issue of climate change is not something that uh, we just read about. It is also something that affects our portfolio companies. And uh, while we were, you know, while we regularly do this, uh, we realize that it is not, you know, just sufficient to uh, consider the risks of climate in our portfolio and just leave it at that. We realize that it was more important for us to probably share the lessons that we learn from our own portfolio companies and uh, some of the climate experts that we talk talk to from now and then, uh, and also develop more innovative financing mechanisms to help our portfolio companies uh, deal with the issue of climate change better. And in fact, in a few weeks, we will be, uh, Caspian Debt will be launching a new climate smart platform uh, that does that, which is uh, sharing of knowledge as well as uh, implementing new financing products to help companies deal with climate change better. But before that, uh, what we are doing today is we're trying to bring together, we, we've tried to bring together uh, some of India's top climate scientists and the CEO of India's uh, largest private weather data services company. Uh, and together they'll talk about uh, things like what changes and patterns of weather mm -hmm. are they observing? Uh, and, and what should an agribusiness or an ag tech company be doing to adapt uh, to climate change? Uh, they'll also talk about uh, you know, aspects like what does it mean for the ability of ag tech companies or agribusiness companies uh, you know to to raise capital or how do how do they grow their business and so on uh, so for the session today 
uh, we have uh, Dr. Chirag Dhara from Kriya University, uh, who's actually a contributing author to the book on assessment of climate change over the Indian region. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dhara. Uh, I also have, we also have Dr. Shamashri Dasgupta from IIT Mandi. Uh, she is also a contributing author to the report on climate vulnerability assessment for adaptation planning in India using a common framework. Uh, we welcome Dr. Dasgupta. Uh, we also have Dr. Ramara from the Central Research Institute for Dryland Agriculture. Uh, he is a, a contributing author to risk and vulnerability assessment of Indian agriculture to climate change. And also Mr. Yogesh Patil, CEO of SkyMet Weather Services, India's largest private weather services company. Welcome Dr. Ramarao and Mr. Yogesh Patil. Uh, this session will actually be moderated by my colleague, uh, Sanjay Sanya, who is uh, who leads Caspian Debt's initiatives in the environment and the climate sustainability space. Uh, he is a clean technology innovation and uh, climate finance expert. So he's the best person to have this conversation with uh, some of the top climate sci scientists that we've been able to bring in. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Yogesh Patil, who, uh, like I said, runs the largest private uh, you know, weather services company in India. So over to you, Sanjay, and uh, I'll be a listener uh, going forward, and I hope this is going to be a very interesting conversation. The request to the guests uh, or the audience in the, in the call is to uh, leave their questions, if any, on the chat box. Uh, we will pick up a few questions as we uh, you know, go through the session. Uh, over to you, Sanjay. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Um, the, I, ha I will have a few questions for you as well. <laughs> uh, the, um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in uh, this afternoon. Uh, I already see uh, people from all over the world, actually. Uh, 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 welcome, and we hope that we will make the next uh, 90 minutes very interesting for you and worth your time. Uh, you know, uh, the way we will do this is that we will try and make it as interactive as possible. So as Avishek said, please start uh, putting in your questions in the uh, chat box, uh, but in order to frame our discussion, uh, we do have a few uh, sort of discussion points ready. So we will use that for the first uh, 40 minutes or so, so that we have the rest of the other 40 minutes uh, open uh, to answer uh, your questions only. Uh, you know, I would start by, you know, asking uh, my panel, that is, what is the time, you know, what prompted them to enter environmental research? And I'll start with you, Chirag uh, Thanks, thanks, Sanjay. And thanks to um, all of the Caspian uh, team for uh, inviting us today. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as for me, um, I, was, uh, I was working in theoretical physics. So I was doing a PhD uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, quantum information theory. And um, uh, you know this was 2008 or so when I began. Uh, towards the end, uh, uh, you know, when I was getting towards the end uh, of my PhD, I started to think that um, I didn't necessarily see myself doing the same things five, 10 years into the future. Um, so one thing I knew was I probably needed to do something a little more grounded. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't know what it was that I wanted. So for me, it was a, it was a very deliberative decision. Um, I, I tried to read as much as I could. Uh, it was one of my one of the most productive times in terms of, um, you know, trying to learn about very very different uh, issues, and uh, had a lot of conversations with a lot of very interesting folks, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, started to uh, come to an understanding that I could take my physics background and um, and translate it into uh, working on climate and ecological issues. Uh, because there's this, I, I do climate modeling now, and uh, you know, one part of climate modeling is is physics. Of course, there's uh, mathematics, chemistry, biology, and so on. But there's a lot of space when you come for the physical sciences. So essentially, I took my uh, sort of background in physics and I moved it from working in uh, sort of theoretical physics to working on issues of climate. That's great. I mean, not too many people in the world do a double PhD, uh, Dr. Ramana. You know. You know, from an economist to getting interested in environment, what was the 
uh, what prompted you to start working on environmental issues? All right, Thank, thanks to Sanjay and Caspian, uh, especially for any researcher uh, to be recognized by stakeholders like uh, industry or for, for our, uh, field of farmers or policy makers to be more satisfying than publishing in a, publishing our work in the high rated journal. So especially research should have relevance to the society around. Uh, with that, uh, just now uh, we actually started off uh, I mean, actually, as you said, I, I'm a time trainer. I'm trained in agricultural economics, uh, but uh, we have been doing uh, research, uh, being uh, uh, associated with the Durand agriculture as part of Indian Council of Agriculture Research. So our major focus is on always natural resource management, like watershed management, soil water relations, this kind of work. But uh, we also started some work on climate change way back in 2007 or 8. Uh, in a network project, but uh, that was still in uh, the nascent stage, but the real impetus came to me personally, as well as to our institute in general, came in 2010 budget, actually, when the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh announced a, some commitment of 600 crores to climate change and agriculture research in the parliament, and that budget session. So that led to a project proposal on a, a project called uh, National Initiative on Climate uh, Resilient Agriculture in 2011, where we were involved in uh, formulating the project. And uh, it was a mega project uh, with uh, 40 plus research institutes uh, in the country belonging to Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and more than 100 uh, Krishi Vigyan Kendras in the country. So as part of this, one of the initial tasks was given to us is, uh, as you know, that uh, investment or um, financial resources are always limited compared to our needs. So we need to some kind of exercise and prioritization, what we should be doing and where we should be spending our money on, especially with relation to climate change adaptation. So that led us to the task of vulnerability assessment of the agriculture to climate change, which we brought out an initial report in 2013, actually. So that actually was well received by many policy makers, including the board, Government of India, state level organizations, uh, international donors like GIZ and all those. Things. So many are using that actually. Then uh, again, uh, you know, IPCC brings out reports, uh, reports. And the AR5 came in, uh, assessment report, I came in 2014. Then that I think we'll uh, contextualize in the next question that we are going to ask. Uh, description of vulnerability or uh, ZARD. Uh, so they came with different climate projections. Uh, Chirag was better actually, more than me. I think uh, so. There were different conceptualization, there were different definitions because of the evolving literature, evolving understanding of how risk management is important. So that led to us to this report that you are referring to that came in the end of 2019. So in a way, it's a project-driven interest and also you know, closely connected to what we have been doing in terms of natural resource management. Thank you. Right. So one project led to another. And of course, we will discuss about your latest report in, in a lot of detail in this webinar. Uh, Dr. Daskipta, what was what led you to environmental research? You also come from uh, an economics background. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. And a very good afternoon to all of you. So my coming to you know environmental issues on environment is quite actually dramatic. And it was a decision uh, from a reading of a night, I would say. So that time I was a graduate student doing my economics in Calcutta University. And uh, I'm talking about, you know, 15, 16 years back. That time we didn't have any compulsory course on environmental economics at the bachelor's level. So, but I was reading on, you know, globalization and trade. So suddenly it intrigued my interest how several commodities which are environmentally degraded, they are barred from trading. There are several restrictions and so on. So that kind of triggered my interest. So there can be a marriage between, you know, economics and environment. And uh, then I, you know, started realizing, okay, economics is basically telling you how to optimally utilize scarce resource and what can be more scarce than environment. And then after I would say a year or so, I came across a book. This is called uh, The Limits to Growth by Dana Meadows and others. And I really read the book for the entire night. And next day morning, I knew what I, I would be doing in the future. So it was quite dramatic, I would say. So that book, sort of uh, shook my you know, ideas and uh, kind of gave the shape to the later activities, whatever I did. After that, I, you know, my entire specialization remained on 
environment, resource, and climate change. Such an inspiring story. And, and Mr. Patel, you have been in this for a long, long time. Yeah, hi Sanjay. Uh, first of all, thanks Caspian and Thai Bangalore team to organize this very interesting webinar. Uh, I think I am the guy who basically accidentally started in this sector, environment. I was not having no intention to do in this. I, I basically a techno commercial guy, started in agricultural risk management, managing supply chains way back in 2004. Okay, so uh, fortunate for me, uh, 2003 4 is the year where a lot of commodity uh, regulations have started coming up in India. NCDs has started, MCX has started. Okay. Similarly, climate related insurance, or you can say a weather index insurance, was started way back in India. Uh, being an electronics graduate, I always uh, fascinated about electronic sensors. Okay. And I was lo always looking for an opportunity where actually I can go back to a sensing part. Okay. So, 2004, Indian government has launched uh, index insurance a lot on the pilot basis. And that was the year where there was no 2G, GPRS, 3G, 4G, nothing. There was only GSM or a landline telephone. And there was a big problem that how to transmit data sets from a remote location to a kind of centralized server. Okay. And, and actually that kind of project is very critical to create this uh, rural agriculture insurance in India in 2004. Uh, so that my background helped me and I thought it's a very interesting uh, uh, project and I thought I will shift from my supply chain uh, expertise into a kind of sensing expertise. Okay, so I moved into this project and I think the observations uh, we have started creating in way back in 2004. So once the observation starts coming, I got an interest in forecasting it. Okay, when the forecasting starts coming in, then I said, okay, how to use these data sets? Okay, then we enter into a kind of application like use satellite, ground, and create a different application. So as, as a person, we always see that there is a business opportunity if there is a climate change. Okay, so although uh, there are a lot of agri techs are basically uh, actually formed considering climate change is an opportunity. And I can say, I think accidentally I entered, but I, I really love this space now. I think that's uh, the common thing for all of us, right? You know, really loving it and being challenged by it all the time. Yeah. Um, this is, of course, a fantastic uh, sort of introduction. Uh, Dr. Dharab, um, you know, we'll get right into the webinar. And in your uh, report, with which you co-contributed with so many authors, assessment of climate change, can you help frame for our audience, which is, you know, young entrepreneurs, um, or maybe not so young entrepreneurs. Um, the, what are we seeing? What has been the observed trends around key issues like you know, warming, like uh, monsoons, like cyclones and droughts? You know, these are the four things that I think most of our agriculture entrepreneurs are really concerned about. And what have you been seeing? Uh, thanks, Sanjay. Um, so, in fact, uh, yeah, so what, what I'm going to talk about is, are some of the assessments that we've made uh, in the report. And uh, in fact, I don't think any of this is going to come as a big surprise. I'm going to quantify some of these things um, as we've assessed them from uh, sort of the observed data of the last, say, 70, 80 years. I don't think any of it is going to come as a conceptual surprise to anyone uh, here, because I think many people here, if not most, are uh, keenly um, uh, sort of informed about climate change issues. So uh, let me try and quantify some of these uh, quantities though. So uh, one of the things, the, the most fundamental climate change uh, indicator is of course temperature. And uh, when it comes to India, uh, what we've assessed is that the temperature change in India uh, relative to pre-industrial times, today is about 0.7 degrees centigrade for the Indian land region. Now, uh, you know, to contextualize that, uh, the global average temperature is about 1 or 1.1 degrees since pre-industrial times, but that's the global average, which, which means it's over land and ocean. But when you just look at global land, the temperature rise is about 1.5 degrees already. So we keep talking about these uh, 1.5 versus 2 degrees. We are talking about the global mean. But when we look at the global land temperature, it's already at 1.5. So it would appear that the temperature rise over India is only 0.7, which is roughly half the global mean. And why is that? 
you know, uh, is India getting lucky? Um, uh, no, in short. Uh, firstly, tropical areas, tropical parts of the world, generally the temperature rise is a little slower than uh, the extra tropics or high latitudes. So that's there anyway. Uh, that's a, just a fundamental feature of the climate system. But uh, another rather important contribution to this muted temperature rise over India is uh, the air, air pollution, what we call aerosols, uh, which is uh, um, you know, very high over the subcontinent, as we all know, only too well. Uh, among many other things, what aerosols do is they mute temperature wise, they actually shade the planet. In a sense, they block some part of the solar radiation, some fraction of solar radiation from reaching the surface and effectively cool the surface. And so the temperature has risen because of greenhouse gases, but it's not risen as fast as it would have otherwise. Now, this is not uh, by any means uh, comforting because aerosols, air pollution, they have a limited lifetime in the atmosphere. And the moment, and this is what we saw last year with all the lockdowns, the moment you stop emitting, very soon uh, those air pollution particles, the aerosols, they start precipitating out. They start uh, from the atmosphere and you get a clean atmosphere. And the problem there is uh, there's actually a temperature rise, which it has muted. So the moment you start removing air pollution from the atmosphere, that sort of a hidden temperature rise will happen very rapidly. You know, it's like a painkiller really, you know, uh, uh, or not painkiller, uh, uh, um, antipyretic. You know, it, it suppresses your fever, but the moment the effects wear out, which can happen quite rapidly, it shoots right back up. So uh, that's why uh, India's air, uh, you know, temperature change is sort of only 0.7 observed, but it's actually a lot larger than that. It's just that air pollution has muted it temporarily. Now, the other thing is, other important variable is rainfall. Now, this was the important one, right? Particularly for agriculture, that's the theme today. Now, several things have happened with, uh, with rainfall. One is in the last 70 to 80 years, uh, India's rainfall has seen a decline on average. Uh, and uh, we've assessed it at about 6% decline today compared to the 1950s. But at the same time, the amount of uh, very heavy precipitation events has increased, okay? So you have a decline in uh, sort of the average rainfall. Uh, at the same time, the extreme events have increased uh, quite substantially. And, you know, I think from newspaper reports and so on, uh, I think people have a sense for this in a qualitative way. But for example, you know, uh, to quantify it, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the daily precipitation, daily rainfall maxima, okay? maximum daily rainfall. Today, it's, uh, and uh, when I say maxima, okay, not maxima, but in a, we define extreme precipitation in a certain way, which is more than 150 millimeters per day, which is very high rainfall. Um, and when we look at these kind of uh, rainfall events, they're 75% larger today relative to the 1950s. It's a, it's a, it's a very big increase. At the same time, the amount of dry spells, which is also particularly relevant to agriculture, that has also increased. So now in the last 30 years, the frequency of these dry spells, very dry spells, is 30% larger than the previous 30 years. Okay. So both the dry spells have increased and daily uh, precipitation rainfall extremes have increased. And of course, given these kind of changes, unsurprisingly droughts have increased in both frequency and the extent, aerial extent of droughts. Uh, and particularly in central parts of the country, there's also this increased severity of droughts. And that also is a pretty uh, straightforward consequence of higher temperatures, which dries out the land surface. You know, there's just becomes drier because of the seed. And uh, so you get these more severe drought conditions. Um, and uh, I think the last thing you asked was about cyclones. And uh, you know, no surprise. One of the uh, one of the um, sort of uh, signals that has emerged very robustly is that you know we used to see many cyclones in the uh, in the Bay of Bengal anyway, but now in the Arabian Sea, uh, over the last 20, 25 years, we are seeing this increasing signal of um, of uh, cyclones uh, of increased severity as well. And again, there is a very straightforward reason for this. Cyclones form over warm waters. So, uh, you know, temperatures about 20, I think it's 28 degrees is kind of the threshold. 
you need temperatures higher than that for a cyclone to really uh, gain strength, to pick up strength. And we are seeing these temperatures increasingly in the Arabian Sea. The temperature rise in the Arabian Sea is much faster than the Bay of Bengal. And, and fueling these, uh, uh, you know, so these cyclones in the Arabian Sea, which used to be rather few in number, they, are, they have much more energy to pick up from the ocean. And so all of these changes that you're seeing in temperature, in rainfall, in drought, cyclones, you name it, they're all interconnected. Uh, we are seeing them in the data. There's, there are very simple physical reasons why we expect them to happen. And our climate models can actually reproduce these trends um, in, in, in their simulations. So that's the... Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, some temperature rise, rise Tem temperature rise can actually accelerate with, you know, decreasing pollution, you know, uh, uh, some decline in monsoon rainfall, but more, uh, you know, more at the extremes, more dry spells as well as uh, more extreme rainfall. And uh, cyclones, not only in the Bay of Bengal, but also in the Arabian Sea, as we saw in Bombay recently. Uh, Mr. Patel, You've been observing data for the last, I, I don't know how many years, you said for, since 2003. Are you seeing the same patterns as well? Or uh, you know, could you tell us a little bit about the patterns that you are seeing? Sure. So uh, Sanjay, uh, we basically, as I mentioned, that we uh, actively work with the crop insurance uh, companies in India. And the moment I said crop insurance is ob obviously there term sheet or the kind of structure or index is based on the last 30 years data sets, which any insurance company or reinsurance company has uh, sourced. And uh, they basically link it with the crop weather calendar. And based on the, the terms I actually has been prepared. Okay. So uh, my experience uh, based on that, because I assume that key, whatever last 30 years data sets, which was used and obviously this climate or we are not uh, present or having data source of our own since that long. Uh, so I assume that is benchmark. Plus we have roughly around 3000 stations stable network for last one decade. Okay, so my, uh, my comparison will be based on that. So what we have observed, okay, uh, and where actually most of the Indian farmers, uh, either they claim that key, we are not getting claims because my trigger has not uh, happened, okay? So there can be one reason. So when we cross verified that, okay, why it is happening? Some people were generally, historically, it's a normal of say 30 degrees Celsius. And there the, the claims are not happening because the temperature either has surpassed or has not, not reached, okay? So when we observe this trend, considering this uh, business case, number one, uh, in case of temperature, yes, I, I absolutely support uh, Dr. Uh, Dara's observation that yes, there is an increase on an average, there's an increase of temperature between one to two degrees Celsius on an average. In some cases, in some of my, some of my stations, we observe the uh, variation in more than three degrees also. Okay. So when I say these observations, these are the sensors which basically are uh, timely calibrated against the primary standard. So I think the comparison which we uh, generally give is based on the sensors where we are confident on the, uh, the, the data sets which has been captured and which has been installed as per the global norms like the WMO norms. Second, uh, in case of temperature, uh, wherever generally the temperatures were reaching 45 degrees, historically normals, uh, are now very comfortably crossing 47 to 48. Okay, so your the, the temperate, the areas where the already hot areas are sometimes, most of the times are crossing uh, two to three degrees increase. That is second. Um, very interestingly, I think uh, 45 plus temperature we started observing in June and October too. Okay. All historically March, April, May it is standard, uh, but observing these 45 plus temperature in June and October is, is something which is strange. Okay. Um, as uh, Dr. Dhara also said that key, uh, your uh, dry spell has increased, the dry period basically. Uh, the same because the hot days are increased. So number of uh, days where the temperature is on the higher side is also increased. So these are our primary observation based on say last one decade's data sets, uh, roughly around 3000 observation points on the ground. Okay. Now in case of rainfall, uh, absolutely the heavy rainfall events have increased. Okay. 
like you are getting a, almost a similar kind of rainfall but in 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 sh uh, shorter period of days so that means your uh, rainy days count has been reduced and intense rain count has been increased the number of days okay uh, we also started observing the uneven rainfall distribution okay so i, I when i interact with the farming community they always used to say ki whenever it rains it used to rain in multiple villages similarly way back in 15 20 years now every uh, villager generally claims that ki um, in the same village uh, certain pockets is and rain but certain pocket it is not rained at all okay so i think these are the primary uh, feedback and observation based on my day to day interactions with the farmers and also on the data sets uh, which we collect primarily on the temperature and rainfall okay. temperature and rainfall so i mean couple of interesting points you know dr dharas comment about 0.7 degree centigrade versus yours of 1 to 2 at least you know over a 10 year period to me seems like an issue of acceleration of warming which is something that i want to come back to later uh, but the other point that you brought up brought up is you know hot days in also being in october number of extreme hot days increasing uh, and uh, you know uh, very irregular spatial distribution even in a small village area i think these are all uh, sort of issues of climate risks you know our webinar today is essentially to talk about how entrepreneurs business people should be reading climate science reports uh, so before we talk about the reports themselves i wanted to just do some framing of the terms and uh, dr thara you have already uh, used the term climate change modeling when you said that's what you do uh, could you tell us as if we were all class 10 students what is climate science modeling i can try so uh, what um uh, so i think i think i could uh, start with uh, um what i hope is a good analogy uh, which is uh, you know you may uh, know of these flight simulators right so if you want to test uh, how aircraft is uh, aircraft um uh, would uh, respond to different atmospheric uh, conditions or uh, you know if uh, for example if you want to simulate how quickly uh, you could make your aircraft actually rise Uh, say two kilometers because of an imminent uh, collision, uh, mid-air collision. Uh, well, uh, you know that depends on the uh, ambient at atmospheric conditions. It depends on how much fuel, uh, uh, which altitude you are at. Um, uh, you know how much fuel it would take. Whether the engine would stall if you try to rise or drop too rapidly. Uh, but the problem, of course, is you don't want to do this in a real aircraft. Um, and uh, but you need to experiment. You need to test. uh what would happen under different conditions and so what you make is a simulator and these simulators typically they they can model air flows they can model what happens when the flaps of your aircraft are uh, their, their uh, angles are are uh, changed angle of attack is changed compared to the wind flow uh, you know the amount of fuel there is and so on and uh, it can it can uh, tell you whether or not your aircraft can actually safely make a certain dive uh, if you need it and uh, so we use these simulators because because we cannot experiment with real aircraft it's too risky when it comes to the climate uh, we don't have the option of experimenting at all there is only one planet and uh, uh, i mean of course we are conducting a, a a massive scale experiment by putting greenhouse gases and aerosols into the atmosphere but we certainly can't conduct more such experiments and so what do we do we try and make these we make these computer programs uh, which and we use a computer as our laboratory and uh, uh, you know basically these programs are a mathematical representation of the entire climate system or at least to the degree that we are able to represent them so you know uh, we have at our atmospheric circulation we have oceanic circulation uh, we have the biosphere uh, you know there's carbon exchange uh, so we uh, sort of describe these interactions put them in mathematical terms in a computer program and run them on the computer and uh, well of course they are supercomputers uh, for the most complex models and then we can do these experiments where we shut off greenhouse gases or we raise greenhouse gases and let the program simulate what the climate will do in the future and uh, you know what the climate will look like 
and uh, or we can reduce our aerosols really rapidly, see what happens or what these models tell us. So, so that's one thing, but how do you test these models? You know, how do we know these models are any good? Uh, for that, typically we use the observational data. Uh, for the last 30 years, we have uh, very good quality satellite data. If we go further back, we have reasonably good quality, uh, you know, ground-based measurements for many parts of the world, mostly land, ocean, less so, but there is. And if you go back much, much farther, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, uh, millions of years, there are different techniques called paleoclimatic proxies, where uh, we can get uh, information about the atmospheric conditions, uh, let's say uh, 500,000 years ago, and so on, from ice cores that we extract from, say, the Antarctic or Greenland. And you can analyze that entire ice core, which is, by the way, kilometers thick, and you can uh, recreate the climate history for the last uh, seven, eight hundred thousand years, a million years. And then, uh, and of course the climate has changed for natural reasons, the climate has changed over this time. And we see whether our climate model is able to reproduce these changes. So it's called a hindcasting. So we check against our paleoclimatic data of the last billion years or whatever, and see if our models, our mathematical model, the computer programs can reproduce those changes given those changes in orbits for or changes in the orbit of the planet and so on. Once we gain confidence that we are able to reproduce that, we use the same model to project into the future. So that's my that model. Fantastic. So it's it's a computer simulation of a complex system and uh, you check whether the simulation is correct by, by checking against historical data you know, over the last 10, 20 years from the data that people like Mr. Patel are collecting but you know you have more sophisticated uh, systems to check data for the over the last you know hundreds of years. Um, there are other terms involved, right? Uh, and Dr. Rao, maybe at this point I'll bring you in uh, to help people, our entrepreneurs, understand the other three terms which they will come across all the time when they read reports: risk. I mean, sorry, <clears throat> vulnerability, exposure, and uh, and therefore risks. I mean, sorry, hazards, vulnerability, exposure, and therefore risks. I think these are the terms there everybody has to understand. Thank you. I think these are some of the words which are we are coming across very frequently in the context of uh, climate change. But at the same time, they are most uh, loosely used terms also in the literature. So whenever I first in the beginning, I will suggest that uh, whenever you read a report on any you know, vulnerability or climate change risk, look at the definition that they, they have used. Because for vulnerability, there are more than 100 definitions in the literature. More than 100 definitions for the vulnerability. So be, because we are talking about climate change, let us uh, stick ourselves to the definitions and conceptualization given by the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So here I will always take one example of uh, illustrating uh, what these words mean. Uh, suppose uh, a guy from Chennai is going to Delhi, say in January or December winter. So he doesn't know anything about the weather in Delhi during that part of the year. So if he goes there without any preparation, what happens? He is likely to affect, be affected by cold or uh, cold attacks, right? So that, that guy without any knowledge of uh, weather in Delhi, without any protective ruling or protective wear, so, so he is more vulnerable to the cold, harsh weather in Delhi compared to the one, suppose other person is going from the Bhopal or somewhere else in Punjab, Nadia is going. He always he has aware of the weather in Delhi, so he always has a, a already has the productive way that he can use there. He goes there, so investing or uh, having the access to protective wear is a kind of adaptation. So the suffering actually that the person, these two persons are likely to face, is actually a kind of risk, <clears throat> amount of risk that if you can put in the monetary terms or in terms of Regular experiences in terms of loss of uh, work value also it can be called as risk but the person who is going there is actually exposure so yeah, when the person is not going to delhi he's not exposed to cold weather so exposure is zero wear. so if he's going to delhi without any protective gear <clears throat> then he is more vulnerable it's a kind of predisposition to some kind of uh, damage or harm or pain that's vulnerability in terms of uh, the current uh, in the climate change context Similarly, suppose we are unprepared for a drought. Chirag was telling, uh, telling, rice fields are more likely to come in future. 
So when, when the farmer is not prepared in terms of uh, having access to irrigation kind of thing, then he is likely to more suffer more because of longer distance or more distance. So person, the farmer without uh, any access to irrigation is more vulnerable to pests in the future. So that is kind of uh, how predisposed he is person in terms of uh, uh, he's being equipped with to deal with that climate uh, harsh, harshness in the future. Uh, this is, a, I love this example, this I think anybody would get, uh, which is, you know, and you have the, I like the way you have linked vulnerability with preparedness. And this is, this webinar is all about, you know, getting to know and therefore getting prepared. Uh, Dr. Daskupta, you teach undergrad students. How do you teach these words to them? Yeah, it's actually very interesting because uh, these are some of the words which are very loosely, you know, and interchangeably used in the literature. So one day you tell them one definition, next day they would definitely come up with some five other definitions and would ask you which one is correct. So uh, see, one thing that I understand, if we want to streamline our understanding in terms of a particular stream of literature, then there has to be a common, you know, a common definition. Otherwise, things become very, very messy. So just following up on what uh, Dr. Ramarao has said, the, how, you know, how we can conceptualize exposure, vulnerability, and, uh, and hazard, I just want to follow up on this by saying that, see, ultimately, we all need to come up with policies that would address these components to address the risk arising out of climate change. Now, if we come to that action part, then you see that uh, if I talk about hazard, which is more like you know extreme events changing the you know climate and so on as an individual as a policymaker it's not really in my hand for a short to medium term it needs to be adjusted in a longer term if you think about exposure that whether you are in delhi or not that again is not really in the hands of policymakers for a short to medium term you can't take the entire population out of delhi and you know posit them in some other place that's not really possible it requires a lot of you know landscape planning and so on but in the short to medium term, what they can address and what as an individual we can probably address in the best possible manner to reduce the risk arising of, out of climate change is to address the component of vulnerability. So that is where you know, comes the importance of vulnerability, which is a system character, right? So whenever, whenever we are talking about vulnerability in the context of climate change, we are not only talking about you know, the drought and the flood, we are also talking about whether the credit mechanism is working, whether the you know, insurance schemes are there. So these are the kind of you know, points of intervention. If you understand what are the sources of vulnerability, you also know what are the points of intervention. So that I think would be very important and uh, discussion in today's forum. Exactly. So the hazards are the climate events and you can't really do much about it uh, you know, at, at an individual company level because that's what we are talking about. But there are things we can do about vulnerability. And that's what we'll talk about. So, you know, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about right from the next question, which is, you know, I want you to think in the next few 15 minutes, put yourself in the shoes of an entrepreneur who is working in Maharashtra and his or her business is to sell fresh fruits. You know, you can think about your favorite fruit, strawberries or whatever. Uh, vegetables and milk, which he or she, she her, her team procures from various districts in Maharashtra. It's a large state and sells them to Pune, to uh, Mumbai, Nasik, urban customers using a very sophisticated web app. Now, Dr. Rao, you have written your report on risk assessment of Indian, uh, of Indian agriculture, and it's a you know, if anybody hasn't read the report, I would really recommend you to look at it because it's a district by district assess assessment of the risk. Now, how should this entrepreneur in Maharashtra be reading your report and getting prepared, as you say? Dr. Rao. Very interesting question. I think, uh, first of all, uh, before going to the report, actually, what we uh, naturally do is that what it does take to start an enterprise on uh, promoting fruits and vegetables or uh, dairy, whatever. So what is resources that are required for going in, for uh, taking the industry like uh, fruits and vegetables? First of all, natural resources in the district, like soil, water, irrigation, rainfall. So this is the one kind of uh, requirements 
Here again, you don't have much control on the in terms of natural resources. On the other hand, demand side uh, condition like uh, what are the income levels of people there, what is the level of productivity, the, the districts, so what is the population density. So all this kind of information uh, is available in this, in this analysis because uh, the conceptualized concept uh, much in this uh, as already brought up uh, in the discussion as a product of uh, three different uh, dimensions, exposure to vulnerability and hazard. So for uh, out of these three dimensions, again, we represented each dimension in terms of different indicators. So for example, in vulnerability indicators, we took about dozen indicators where we talk about uh, what are the what is the soil groundwater availability in each district. What is the uh, soil condition in terms of uh, available water holding capacity of the soil in the district? What is the rural population density in the uh, in the district? What is the per capita income in the district? Because uh, demand is actually a function of uh, incomes of people in the district. So if you want to locate your uh, industry where uh, in certain locations, these are the conditions that we can easily identify. So this is the beginning. This kind of information will be. Uh, available in this world. But at the same time, it's not enough because the district is still, because uh, we did the district analysis because district is administrative unit in the country for most of development planning and administration. But still, uh, district, there is a very variability within the district also. That is not available in the district. We have to go for uh, some other sources, uh, uh, especially state uh, government resources are available where the block level or uh, sub district level data is already available. But if you want to uh, bring the, again the context of dimension into this. We actually <coughs> uh, made available the climate projections. Uh, we are because this is about agriculture. We always try to uh, think in terms of the indicators which are relevant to agriculture. For agriculture monsoon is very important. So when we say monsoon, the months of June and July are very key. So what is going to going to happen for June and July in fall? Uh, what is the what do the climate projections say about? Uh, June and July rainfall. So whether the how the rainfalls or rainfall is going to change in future. So that is critical for uh, uh, sowing operations or crop planning. Similarly, how the dry spells or drought is going to increase, decrease or no, change over time into the future. So how the climate part, and this brings actually question uh, where you can, especially we talk about protected cultivation, uh, soil water conservation, rainwater harvesting, uh, all this kind of intervention if you want to make, this kind of information will be useful, including the extreme rainfall events. So we actually we conceptualize four kinds of extreme rainfall uh, uh, events in the, uh, this analysis. So how the rainfall is going to extreme rainfall is going to increase. There are different definitions of uh, extreme rainfall again, but uh, for the sake of uniformity, we took uh, to uh, like a maximum rain, rain, uh, rainfall event. So how much it is going to change in the future? Similarly, a uh, 99 percentile rainfall, how it's going to change? So because these have uh, uh, implications to rainwater management, groundwater management, power uh, bills, so all those kind of things have implications. And one more thing is that uh, protected cultivation, this kind of thing, uh, sorry, uh, not protected cultivation, rainwater harvesting, because uh, most of the climate projections say that uh, uh, annual rainfall or the annual scale is going to increase uh, in the future, at least in the, by 2050 century period. So we have more opportunities for harvesting rainwater. So where we can uh, harvest rain, uh, extreme, uh, even the extreme rainfall events are also an opportunity to harvest rainwater. So we have to have uh, uh, plans for uh, rainwater harvesting because there, are, there is more possibility to harvest more water going forward. But at the same time, we have to use that water. We have to make provisions. We have to have technologies uh, to store that water and to be used when it is actually needed. So it's a dry spells. So we have more water to be harvested, but again, we are, uh, we are going likely to have more dry spills, longer dry spills. So this, how to better and conserve this rainwater harvested till the periods of dry spills. Otherwise, if we cannot store this rainwater to the period of dry spill, again, it's not useful in terms of agriculture. It has other purposes, but uh, as far as your crop planning in terms of that may not be more useful. So we have to harvest, we can harvest more water. We can use that water uh, to save the crop during the dry spell. So, uh, so in that fashion, I check district wise information is available. But I would like to say that again, there is inter district variable is still there. Some districts are very large. So those things have to be factored in. 
Right. So I'll just summarize it uh, for our audience once. So this entrepreneur, in a, he or she can look at all the districts of Maharashtra, uh, and 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 you have in your in your report you have got models of not only annual rainfall but you know rainfall in June, July, you know prediction of drought, likelihood of drought, of course, prediction of likelihood of extreme rainfall events across all these districts for at least you know in a one reasonable time period. And then you have indications of vulnerability. So based on which, with, based on that data, this entrepreneur can decide, you know, which districts are more vulnerable. What is the type of uh, hazard uh, that he or she is likely to be exposed to and therefore, you know, take corrective actions. And you have already, of course, started talking about one corrective action, which is rainwater harvesting. But uh, you know, I'll come back to you for more corrective actions later. And then Dr. Daskupta, you have done a similar uh, sort of analysis, but yours is, as you have already alluded to, much more focused around, around vulnerability. Let's talk about the same entrepreneur. And he or she has read Dr. Rao's report, and now you know, it's, a, it's a Friday afternoon, and he or she is reading your report. What is it that she should be looking at in your report? Friday afternoon is a bad time to read our report. Okay, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So jokes apart. So it's kind of a, you know, it, it follows from what uh, Dr. Rao has said. So if you look at our report, we have focused more on, on vulnerability, which means we have not taken into consideration and, you know, very carefully, we haven't taken into consideration any weather related or climate related variable. Uh, the reason, let me explain, because this is one of the questions that we often face, that if you can understand what is the vulnerability at the current climate scenario, then that is going to, uh, you know, be augmented if the climate changes. So you are just, if you calculate the current vulnerability, then you know what is the best possible situation that you are in and which is going to be worse in the future. So uh, if you look at our report, this is uh, not only the agricultural vulnerability, but this is a more comprehensive vulnerability, socioeconomic vulnerability, vulnerability in terms of infrastructure that we are talking about. So if you really want to you know, uh, understand, for example, how you run the business, for example, in a certain district of Maharashtra, then I would say you start from the back of the report where all the data are given. So this is one good thing about the report that we have given, you know, that data for as, as it is also given uh, in the CRIDA report, the data for all the districts, all the indicators that has been used, the source and data for all the districts. Now, how do you read the data in order to aid the purpose of yours? So I would, you know, uh, talk about the following approach. If you want to run a business, you need to understand the demand side as well as the supply side. Now, let me try to identify certain indicators which are sort of demand side indicators and certain indicators which would be the supply side indicators and how they are related to the whole discourse of you know, climate change and vulnerability so on. So for example, uh, suppose I run a dairy business. So there is an indicator which is called the livestock to human ratio. So if you find out that there are districts where the livestock to human ratio is very less, then you know that this district has a potential where the livestock rearing can be you know, much more that not only creates a livelihood opportunity, but it also sort of you know, gives the population in that region a cushion when certain climate extreme events happen. Because these livestock act as, as, as sort of an asset which can sustain some of the climatic events and those can be sold off at, under you know, huge distress and so on. So this is one indicator that you can look at. So this is again, you are choosing where, where to you know, operate and how that can aid to the larger discourse of development. Next, you can also look at the indicator, which is called the yield variability. So see, this is not, this, this apparently, this has nothing to do with the climate or you know, weather data, but yield variability means if you take a particular crop, then how the yield or production per hectare of this crop is varying over a period of time. If the variability is very high, that means the production of this crop is highly sensitive to the climate events. So if you can identify the, you know, the areas where the crop variability is high, then probably you can motivate you know, the farmers in that area to switch the crop 
from the one which is highly variable, whose productivity is highly variable in nature, to some other crops, for example, horticulture or vegetables and fruit trees like that, which are more resilient to climate change. So if you go through these indicators, they will kind of give you an understanding what would be the location from where you can collect the material which can go to the market. Next, coming to the demand. Now, again, as you know, Professor Rao has said, one of the major indicators of demand is the income that you have. So you look at the you know, districts where the per capita income is high. You look at the districts where you know, women participation is labor force is higher because these are the areas where you can you know, sell uh, you know, milk or nutritious food more through a kind of you know, penetrating it in the family. So look at these kind of districts. Look at the road connectivity. So that's one of the major challenges that you see in the in the context of you know climate change adaptation. Look at the road connectivity. Look you know where uh, there are more infrastructural uh, uh, you know, is there. Look at the districts where IMR is very high. That infant mortality rate is very high, which shows that the health condition is not good. So you 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 try to identify these places as a market of nutritious food that you are planning to sell. So this is how I would suggest that first thing that you can do, go through the numbers that are given to the end of the report. And then you come to the state specific report where a district level analysis has carried out by the state itself. So the understanding that has gone into that part of report is really deep. So this is how I think uh, you can you know, uh, make use of the report. Fantastic. So, so start with the data. You know, and I, I really like this. You know, start from the from the back of the report, um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, identify you know what the data means for you in terms of supply and demand, and what it means you know linking with what you and Dr. Rao said, what it means in terms of preparation. That even if there is an extreme climate event of which we have no control of, which you have already referred to, what is it? How can I be better prepared, both in terms of demand and supply? That is what you'd, uh, you know, that, that's a, what our entrepreneur can get out of your report. However, getting to understand the data is one thing, but taking action is completely another. So Dr. Rao, I'll go back to you. And you have already mentioned one action, which is, you know, rainwater harvesting. But, um, but district by district, you know, can you, help this entrepreneur sort of define that range of actions he or she can take based on the data that is available in your report? I think the report provides what kind of risk or what kind of hazards that the district is going to face to different degrees. But there are a range of technological options, management options from the farmer's point of view. So that brings again the other enabling I see private industry as an enabler of uh, technology adoption or uh, uh, <clears throat> better uh, their livelihoods and other kind of things. So one thing is that uh, ICR, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, as well as uh, State Agricultural University and private uh, researchers, private industries also very significant player in agriculture research and development. So they are coming out with a lot of uh, improved crop varieties, including fruits and vegetables which actually is resistant to the dry spells or uh, heat stress or temperature stress, or which are short duration in their, uh, uh, to come to their maturity so that they will escape the harsh weather uh, kind of things. So there are crop varieties available for that. So we can actually participate in trying to locate that kind of varieties and making available the kind of seed material to the farmers. This is the first one thing. And second thing is already talked about rainwater, rainwater harvesting. And uh, the, actually, Krida has in some variants in other, other reports for Maharashtra, especially, they did uh, some analysis uh, on opportunities for rainwater harvesting, how they are going to change over time. So, how, how the rainfall is going to change in future. So, what is the runoff potential that can be harvested, so which can be made available to the crop, agricultural crops uh, as and when they need it. So, that uh, specific analysis is already available in the uh, uh, research work. Also, micro irrigation. So, if you look at the country, so there is potential for about 40 million hectares for micro irrigation. But right now, it is actually less than 10 million hectares of, because efficient use of rainwater. Climate change actually boils down to efficient use of anything and everything. So, you have to use your uh, 
resources creation tree that actually helps you in both kind of in uh, adaptation as well as mitigation. So use actually there is a, one concept called uh, climate smart agriculture uh, in the international literature being promoted by Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations uh, Organization. So that's actually that sees climate smart agriculture as a combination of nutrient smart, water smart, energy smart, policy smart, and of agriculture. So when you say nutrient smart, you have to reduce your uh, fertilizer use in crop production. We are talking about organic uh, cultivation and all, all things. But one of the key pollutants is the use of nitrogen uh, fertilizer. Uh, in crop production, be in uh, crops like rice and wheat or other uh, crops. So we have to reduce the use of uh, uh, nitrogenous fertilizer in particular and all fertilizer use in general. So there is scope for uh, and, uh, technologies and uh, improved inputs into uh, fertilizer. Recently we are talking about nano fertilizer kind of thing, uh, name coated urea. So these are the kind of uh, initiatives that we can look at. Uh, also balanced use of fertilizer in another way area where we can actually try to we can protect the crops. Balanced is, uh, uh, right now uh, we are giving emphasis on uh, uh, use of nitrogen compared to phosphorus or potassium and micronutrients. So balanced is uh, just like human beings, we talk about uh, uh, an ideal mix of dietary diversity and uh, nutrition diversity. Similarly, uh, plants also need actually uh, both uh, NP, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, they are called actually macronutrients and other iron, zinc, sulfur, these are called micronutrients. So there is, uh, should be adequate emphasis on both uh, macronutrients and uh, micronutrients and, uh, as, as well as the ratios of uh, uh, applying to the crop plants. So this is another area. Actually, there are KVKs and agricultural universities and Indian Council of Agriculture Research. They are technologies, they are methods, and they have proven what to be done uh, to protect the crop uh, in this kind of uh, situation. And another thing is, Plastic culture, plastic, plastic mulching, especially in vegetables like uh, tomato, brinjal, actually use of plastic, uh, spreading the plastic on the surface actually reduces your uh, loss of moisture from the soil, loss of water. So if you use plastic culture, plastic mulching and other things actually, micro irrigation are another kind of technologies. There are a number of technologies available which can be used actually to deal with uh, the aberrations or uh, hazards that are uh, likely to occur. In, uh, in the context of climate change. In terms of uh, dairy, again, uh, fodder shortage, especially during summer, is going to be uh, is going to be one of the manifestations of problems of climate change, especially in the situations of drought. So we, especially in Maharashtra, we hear about farmers selling their livestock or uh, farmers taking their livestock to animal camps in a distant place. They took uh, their animals to a place the fodder is available for a month or two in summer, then bring back the animals to, the, to their own villages. So we have some certain interventions uh, where we can uh, make a silage out of the green fodder or clay fodder. Then we can store that uh, silage during the periods of uh, lane period, uh, shortage, like, especially during summer months. So this kind of uh, technologies are available. And, uh, and the one thing is that uh, we also talk about institutional interventions uh, when we're dealing with climate change. The report also has some information on central groups. They actually relate to women, and women are more linked to livestock compared to men. So that information will also be useful uh, in planning uh, livestock and things, and also insurance. I think uh, Yogesh will be much better person to talk about insurance. But uh, uh, insurance has a potential, is useful, is needed, and everything. Is, uh, we know the, many of the problems, but there are two or three caveats for insurance. So like, the flag here. One is uh, all said and done, still the basis risk insurance is in agriculture. Still, uh, agriculture risk is more covariate compared than it is reducing genetic risk. So, agriculture risk is still more, uh, more covariate. So, and then again, the quantification of relationship between weather and agricultural yields or incomes is still uh, not uh, adequately done. So, that is also another reason why. Uh, Species risk is high. And there is another thing is that uh, already agriculture insurance, and you can look at the premiums and payout ratios uh, for the country level, they are not still favorable. But when you say that climate change is going to be un uh, unfavorable or it is uh, going to lead more yield variability or income variability, obviously the premiums have to increase. 
Unless right. You want to right. Right. So, I mean, a, a range of options, you know, climate smart options, which includes resource efficiency, but then you ended with, you know, risk mitigation as well, which is insurance. So, you know, uh, a, a, a full range of options which are available almost as a bouquet. Uh, Dr. Daskupta, uh, any additional uh, sort of measures that this entrepreneur can take based on the reading of your book? I mean, your report. Uh, yeah, yeah. Especially, and let me just phrase this a little bit, especially because your vulnerability, your report on vulnerability is not just agriculture, right? Uh, but it, so it is more sort of uh, broader, right? So in that context, you know, how can it use your data for adaptation planning in the districts that it is operating? Yeah, so I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll talk about those which are not mentioned by uh, Professor Rao, because some of them are really overlapping and you always get these indicators which can be worked upon. So one issue I would like to mention is the informed decision making. So as an entrepreneur, when I'm procuring the, you know, the product from the farmer, it's very important that the farmer is making a decision which is informed. Now, this is probably a kind of you know, business model that the agri-tech companies can think of how to provide correct information to the, you know, the farmers. Because I give you a small example, we have done, not as a part of this report, but separately we have experience where you know, in the Kashmir Valley, uh, the farmers are shifting from paddy to apple cultivation, but they don't know what the problems are associated with the apple cultivation as well. So the, you know, the next option that they are going to, that probably is not the best possible option that they should go to. So this is one point of intervention, which would be very important. And that needs to come from this kind of companies to the farmers. And I have been actually seeing a number of questions about the marginal farmers. And if you think about the marginal farmers, this kind of providing of the information is very, very crucial to them because they really don't have access to information. They don't have access to technology. They don't have access to resources. Therefore, the decisions that they take, you know, in terms of, you know, what is the time of sowing, what would be the time of harvesting, what to, what to produce, these kind of decisions, many a times it may go wrong. So this is one very important point of intervention that can, where these companies can actually make a lot of contribution and that can aid to climate change adaptation. That is one part of it. Credit and insurance. I mean, there is no, that, that has to be there. And that is not really working very well in India, I'm sorry to say, because in many of the districts, we have seen that very small fraction of land is actually covered by the centrally funded or state funded schemes like that. So that's another you know, way of intervention. The third point, actually four things I wanted to mention. The third point is, uh, we know that there is a lot of livelihood pressure on agriculture. More than 60% people in India, they are actually based depending on the agriculture. And as the hazard increases, as the, you know, the climate variability increases, there is, we can't really deny that the productivity is going to fall probably. I mean, some, I mean, we can't accommodate more and more people in the production sector of agriculture. So in order to support the agriculture, there has to be the agri-tech industry, there has to be you know, food technology, there has to be allied industries which has to come up. And one potential source towards adaptation is to see the farmers who are not being able to cope with production activity, how they can be absorbed in the allied industry that can come up with the agricultural sector. And uh, one more very important thing is going, which is going to play an important role is the packaging. You know, as the temperature increases, how do you do the packaging so that the, you know, the shelf life increases so that it lasts long? when you are transporting it from one place to other. So these three are very important. And the fourth one, that's more generic. See, this is the role of you know, women participation in the labor force. There are uh, you know, multiple ways through which women participation can actually augment the development of the area. So this is another way these companies can make an intervention to you know, you know, by, by accommodating or by giving the opportunity to more and more women in the locality to develop the, you know, the, the corporations, to develop the self-help groups and so on. To, to, so, so what I'm saying is that you can actually get good entrepreneurs from women, which has been overlooked for you know, various years. So that is another 
uh, that is another way to explore things so these are the four things i wanted to talk about in an addition to what uh, professor rao has already mentioned and, and this, because these are products so. Yes. that you brought, brought these up. Uh, Vishak, I'll come back to you uh, later, just flagging this off for, for, for you immediately on two points that Dr. Dr. Dasgupta said, which is about you know, credit and you know, given your experience around microfinance and financial inclusion, I'll also come up come to you for your comments around um, uh, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs and women, you know, I'm going to add a point there, credit to women, women farmers as well. Uh, but, uh, but hold your thoughts. We, uh, we, you know, we have talked a lot about this entrepreneur who is selling uh, fresh fruits and vegetables in parts of Maharashtra. I want to just step back and say, uh, many of the people who are on this call today are in their 20s and 30s. Almost everybody from the Caspian group is in that um, uh, age. You know, I definitely am not a representation. Um, yeah. uh, Dr. Dhara, you know, you have done, in your climate modeling, what do you expect them to see in by the time they come to their 50s? That is by mid-century, which I know is a sort of important year in climate science. Um, yeah, hi, uh, Sanjay. So I think I'll try and make this quick because I just realized that there might be questions and we are uh, getting close to um, uh, 90 minutes. So uh, very briefly, uh, you know, uh, one thing we've assessed for temperature rise, uh, for average temperature rise over India is uh, in excess of two degrees uh, by mid-century. But of course, uh, here, you know, there are uh, different kinds of climate change scenarios. Uh, they, are, they are sort of um, defined uh, by the IPCC. And I'm speaking of a particular climate change scenario, which is called the RCP 4.5, which is kind of a mid-range emission scenario. Uh, and we uh, sort of, uh, I'm deliberately talking about that because uh, I don't want to use an extreme emission scenario, nor do I want to use a very optimistic one. But this is what uh, I and uh, several of my co colleagues, we consider uh, more realistic. Uh, that's arguable, but that's how I'm talking about it today. So in excess of about two degrees by mid-century temperature rise, and remember the current one is about 0.7 is what we've assessed. So that's quite a significant change in uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, heat waves, that's the, that's the big big one. Uh, we've assessed a change in, uh, the, in the frequency of heat wave by about a factor of two and a half, a factor of 2.5 uh, greater than the recent past. And uh, the average duration of heat rays by about 20% more than the recent past. By recent past, I mean uh, the last 30 years on that, uh, average of last 30 years. Uh, precipitation, uh, I think uh, Dr. Ramara already said it, uh, we generally expect precipitation to increase and uh, we assess in the range of about six to 7% uh, in the next 30 years. And, uh, and certainly an increase in uh, of uh, rather a big increase in extreme rainfall events. I'm not going to quantify that because there's a very wide range among climate models on this goal uh, for various reasons. We can't model them very well just yet. Uh, but uh, what is certainly clear is that there is going to be an increase with global warming. And in fact, the rate at which this increases is generally faster than the rate of uh, change in the mean rainfall. And finally, cyclones. Um, once again, uh, cyclones uh, are also a complicated business, but uh, cyclo cyclogenesis, cyclogenesis, as we call it, the formation of cyclones and the frequency is relatively difficult to model into the future. But one thing that's very, uh, very clear from the theory and from the models is that intensities are going to continue to rise and particularly in the Arabian Sea, because uh, as I said, the Arabian Sea has been warming faster, more rapidly, than uh, uh, other parts of the Northern Indian Ocean. And that's also projected to continue into the future, which uh, is directly connected to fueling uh, cyclones of greater intensity. Right. I, I, I'm glad that you sort of contextualized this in the context of moderate emission scenario, because that's what we should expect, uh, you know, in uh, assuming all the countries, uh, uh, you know, get to the at least all the major countries get to their net zero standards. And I think there's increasingly political pressure to do so. Uh, 
you know, one thing, uh, we're coming to the end of the uh, orchestrated amount before we take questions, but uh, Mr. Patel, I wanted to come back to you and ask you one question. Uh, you know, Dr. Ramarao talks about a range of technology options at the farm level. You know, in your experience, having worked, uh, you know, practically, uh, how hard or difficult it is to help farmers move to these technologies? Okay. So, uh, Sanjay, I think uh, we, we have seen multiple agricultural technology companies uh, in the agricultural area, uh, particularly in trying to influence and are influencing the farming community. Uh, but their primary aim, uh, whatever I've seen, is not to influence the farmer. Okay, so basically they are trying to create a value in the agricultural value chain and other stakeholders also. That is their primary aim. Okay, I have not seen any uh, ag tech startup who completely focusing on improve, uh, making farmers climate smart. I think that is the prim primary task of the policy intervention or the government or the research organization. Okay, so that is one absolutely uh, ag tech companies are uh, can influence and create uh, things for farmer or you can influence them to use the technology okay uh, i can i can i can give some examples like uh, companies like us like we generally have a, a top down approach so we use sat iot and all other activity and we generally provide alerts or kind of climate smart solutions to farmer on the larger area okay it's not very plot specific as on date but the larger area okay there are certain startups who basically provide solutions to farm specific. Okay, so they basically, they go for a, a precision ag, put the sensors in an individual farm, create a pest and disease model and provide an advisory to farmers. Okay, so when we talk tech, okay, I'm, I'm generally talking about the farmers which are on the, the topmost pyramid. Okay, I'm not talking about small and marginal farmers. Okay, they are the most difficult people to reach out generally, okay. Uh, because they are, I generally, our, my experience is that generally it doesn't carry a smartphone and all. It's very difficult to reach out, even if for the uh, the institutional credit and everything I'm saying, not for insurance also. Okay. Um, but if you, if you talk about this, uh, I think uh, it is very essential to make them aware uh, about the uh, climate change or climate risk. We need to engage them and ultimately I think uh, their action is also critical. I think to make the entire society as in climate smart. This is what generally, I think the, it's a Krida term that climate smart village or climate smart agriculture. So their involvement is very critical. I just want to give one example of making them uh, involved, uh, particularly the children. Uh, there's a one district in Maharashtra called Latur and very interesting project I uh, experienced a couple of years back. Uh, there is one uh, local farmer leader or the activist has uh, basically started uh, a community radio for climate change and its risk uh, communication to farmers particularly okay so he started that uh, by saying ki, okay this is a radio where a gram panchayat can have and, and weekly or daily he can bring a different experts from climate change and he can communicate and make them aware okay so once he started he understood that the uh, making them aware in the schools or colleges is more critical okay so they have started putting uh, these uh, radios uh, in the every school and colleges of that district or around his uh, Tessil. Okay. I think that is something has started uh, uh, becoming more influential in making them adopting the new technologies. Okay. Uh, but ultimately, is absolutely uh, government without uh, the policy intervention is absolutely not possible. Uh, only act tech companies uh, can't do this. They need a policy support and ultimately in capital also, both. Uh, we need, I think, uh, we need something like EV, whatever government policy and government intervention in this electric vehicle policy. I think we should see something in the act tech space also. Unless and until uh, that kind of intervention happens, okay, it is very difficult, okay. And the last requirement is absolutely a capital one. Okay, we need more and more Amazon kind of climate fund, uh, more focused on the agriculture side. Okay, because I think most of these actex are either bootstrapped or very uh, barely funded. Okay, and I, I think once you have this, I think the actex will start uh, delivering in convincing farmers to adopt these technologies. 
Right. Uh, so I think communication is an, is an important issue. And I do hope some people in the foundation and CSR sites have heard what you said here, Yogesh. Even, uh, we should make that message very clear that, you know, they need to be able to provide certain type of risk absorption funds to make this communication very, very uh, open to uh, especially small and medium farmers who are difficult to reach, as you immediately said. Avishak, uh, you, know, uh, we, we, uh, you know, maybe you want to just sum up this, this part of the discussion by reflecting on two or three issues. One is, you know, how should agri-tech companies, you've seen the you know, this type of data that is available, how should agri-tech companies sort of uh, uh, implement climate risk in their own business? And reflect on these two questions that Dr. Dasgupta brought about, which is, you know, financial inclusion in farmers, especially women farmers and women entrepreneur farmers. Yeah, thanks, Ajay. And uh, of course, it's there are a lot of things uh, swirling in my head. Uh, so I'll try to kind of condense it and, uh, you know, uh, summarize it. Uh, so, of course, the problem is quite challenging. And uh, is it one actor that can solve all these problems? I guess the answer is no. Uh, and multiple actors are required. Uh, from our limited experience, uh, historically, we've, uh, we've essentially uh, been, had, we've had the privilege of uh, kind of, uh, you know, shaping the financial inclusion industry in India uh, as Caspian. And uh, one of the things that I think we were able to do well uh, was uh, kind of blend uh, social sciences along with the money uh, to really uh, kind of create uh, for-profit business models that were scalable uh, to kind of bring in a little bit of a change. I don't, I, I, I won't say that we've changed everything, but at least uh, the condition is uh, so much more better. Now, uh, drawing from that experience, what I can, from that financial inclusion experience, what I can uh, clearly see is that uh, the entire set of issues around climate change uh, and financing is even more complex. It, it, it's not just about, uh, you know, social sciences. Now you have climate sciences also that needs to be added to the mix along with getting the right kind of financing. So we have, were successful in getting the right kind of funding uh, or financing for the uh, social issues or, or the social milieu that we were kind of dealing with as far as financial inclusion is concerned. What we want to do uh, going forward is obviously add this angle of climate sciences to it and, uh, you know, bring in the money, uh, which actually kind of does justice to the concerns that social scientists or climate scientists uh, would typically raise. Uh, so that's what we, uh, you know, I think at the beginning of the session, I was talking about us uh, launching a platform to be able to do that, both in terms of sharing knowledge and also about bringing in innovative financing mechanisms. But uh, without even having done all of that in a platform kind of a basis, what we've done till now in, in, in some sense, for example, is uh, we've had the privilege of working with, uh, for example, Yogesh's company, uh, SkyMet, where we uh, kind of helped in, uh, we helped in financing uh, several of their uh, automatic weather stations, which were essentially providing data to insurance companies to provide risk mitigation services or crop insurance to the small farmers, uh, you know, uh, who crop, uh, crop insurance to small farmers. Uh, to uh, Dr. Dasgupta's point about, uh, you know, about increasing awareness, uh, we funded companies that actually go about uh, sh sharing information uh, with farmers, especially around uh, you know climate issues and cli market market factors uh, in 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 uh, poorer states in the country, uh, we are uh, we funded the largest organic food products brand in the country, uh, and we we basically funded a number of agri tech companies which are operating in improving the efficiencies of the agri supply chain by, for example, reducing wastage uh, one. Uh, trying to get better or remunerative, you know, more remunerative prices for the farmers. And not just that, but also, uh, you know, for example, trying to transition uh, their supply chain into a more low emission uh, kind of a supply chain. Now that's not been perfectly easy. It has been difficult because of two reasons. One, like Yogesh mentioned, mentioned lack of capital. And the other aspect also is that a lot of the research that has happened is still not fully understood by, uh, you know, the uh, non-scientific uh, community of which, which includes the entrepreneurs as well. 
so i think there is a role for people like us to play uh, where we can you know through these uh, kind of uh, sessions or 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 discussions we can bring this knowledge that is already there and enable uh, you know agri tech companies to transition into a, a more sustainable supply chain business so that they can't just they don't they don't just improve the supply chain quality but they also improve uh, the income at the level of the small and marginal farmer which we all know today is possibly the most riskiest uh you know livelihood that you can be in and possibly the least earnings uh, uh that that uh, a farmer or small farmer typically gets and that needs to change and i'm hoping that uh with with the combination of the knowledge and the financing we would be able to kind of uh, fast track the process of having a more uh, sustainable and an equitable uh, you know agri supply chain per se so i think that's uh, that's what i had to say uh, as enjoy to this right uh, this is great and i think you know one of the questions we had is about how to improve the productivity of of uh, i mean the productivity of the income of of small holder farmers you know uh, by one of the entrepreneurs in this uh, in the chat box actually by by our uh, by our client actually hema and maybe dr rao uh, you know this has already come up dr rao any final thoughts on that question how does this on ent- an entrepreneur improve the incomes of small holder farmers i think there are three or four options that we can uh, consider for increasing incomes of farmers uh, <coughs> one is technology maybe improved varieties better fertilizer management better nutrient management irrigation kind of things and second thing is diversification towards high value crops as you said uh, diversification towards fruits and vegetables but uh, that the cost for action in other spheres like uh, value chains supply chains uh, market linkages through farmer producer organizations so just by saying that you grow tomato or potato is not enough so we have to link those farmers to markets so we have to have the we have to invest in supply chains and value chains and then the third one is incentives by the government in terms of uh, equipment price or uh, uh, procurement and minimum support price they should be effective right now though they announce uh, msp per 23 crops they are effective only in rice and wheat the crop especially millet pulses and oil uh, seeds they are not effective only hardly less than 5% of this production is actually procured by the government agencies so there is market uh, price fluctuations uh, and then uh, fourth one is cost cutting or uh, the cost we have to reduce the cost of production uh, so there are uh, other avenues uh, or uh, increasing uh, decreasing cost of cultivation or cost of production thereby so cost savings cost savings is actually income made so there are four or five avenues and there are options for each of these uh, things uh, where technologies are available options are available success stories are available different uh, places but they are lying as islands of success but uh, we need to mainstream them we need to promote them as i said uh, we it needs a uh, combined or uh, the orchestrated action among different actors research agencies private agencies investors ngos uh, csr uh, initiatives government uh, including government agencies so that uh, that needs actually concerted effort and we have diversified uh, maybe we have to take people out of agriculture also right now uh, our 14% of our gdp or gva is coming from agriculture but uh, 51% of people are dependent on agriculture essentially you are sharing uh, more than half of the population or workforce is sharing 14% of gdp so that talks about the inequity of agriculture or low productivity of agriculture so we have to take people out of agriculture for that again we have to invest in skill building of the people skilling india mission is already there the government of india so we have to act on different fronts uh, so that the farms income can be increased right uh, so so range of uh, crops and a range of technologies but also working with other programs is 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 the message uh, for uh, our aspiring agricultural entrepreneur but the one thing that one question that has come up uh, and we had kind of the last one or two minutes but i think this is an important question and we should take it is that this research you know these models will change right we will update the models and you know various agencies will be doing it you know what's the best way according to you to um, so, sort of have a centralized place where entrepreneurs and farmers can go to to get these models 
and you know reflections from all of you on this topic. Maybe starting with uh, Dr. Dhara, you. Um, I, I think I'm not the right person to uh, really answer this question. Um, so I think uh, the others are probably better placed to take this question. Okay. Than I am. So the question is, what is this? How, how, what's the best way to make this data centrally available? You know, the vulnerability analysis and the, and the climate projections that you make and so on and so forth. I mean, if theoretically, if you have a web portal, right, which is continuously up, oh. update, updated, Right. The, the data itself. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's something which uh, we have found some difficulty with. There are several departments uh, that are not very keen on sharing their data. I'm uh, really not going to name any names here, but uh, I think many of us have probably bumped up against those uh, problems. So I, I think especially those um, uh, you know, institutions that are publicly funded, uh, they really should be forced to share their data on a central portal. I, I think this is, um, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know how one might go about doing that, but certainly there's a lot of data, important data out there that sometimes have to, has to be bought. And it's extremely expensive if you're not uh, within that sector that gets it within the sort of that uh, group of uh, institutions that gets the data for free. Uh, so I think these are, uh, you know, particularly given the risk assessments that we need to do, uh, you know, our, our uh, report is fortunately uh, all the data that we've used, they are, uh, they are all available, um, uh, you know, uh, climate data is available on the CMIP, uh, they're called CMIP 6, CMIP 5 and CMIP 6. All this data is available for free. There is no problem there. Everyone, anyone can go and pick up that data. You just need a little bit of technical know-how, not too much to be able to uh, grab the data and then um, sort of start working with it. Uh, but observational data, uh, you know, which is critical for some of this work, uh, that's, that's something which uh, has become something of a problem. Uh, although there, are, there have been some developments. So for example, uh, ocean data, I believe, uh, that's become more readily available now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, so, but uh, when it comes to ground measurements, and so on. Uh, those data need to be av available for free for the whole public, at least for non-commercial use. Right, but but just zeroing it a little bit onto a district level data. You know, Dr. Daskupta, your type of data, and Dr. Rao, your type of data. Is it possible to think of this available in a web portal, which an entrepreneur uh, can can, can uh, sort of look at? It, you know, updates to your reports coming in the same web portal. Is it possible at all? Uh, if you want me to be very honest, uh, the answer is actually no. Mm. Why? I, I'll, I'll explain you why. Because uh, see, the data that we have used, these are all publicly available data for one part of the report. The other part of the report that the states have developed, those also came from the, you know, the public sources. But they had to put a lot of effort to get this data from the block level to from the district level. So at the very first place, the challenge is that we don't have data. Forget about putting it in one place, we don't have data. If you ask me the socioeconomic indicators, you go get, you actually get those in every 10 years. So to be very honest, the data that I'm using in today's vulnerability map, that's actually the data from 2011. I don't know what is the relevant, I mean, how well that is actually reflecting the current day situation. So that's a very, very challenging problem that we have that we don't have the data. That is, that is problem number one. So if you know, the organizations, the institutes who are working with the data, they don't have access from one single portal, then it would be very difficult from the companies who actually, you know, think about a central location from where they would get all information. But I would say there is a way out. It's more like, you know, a hyperlinked search. So once you find out one report, you can always get into touch with that particular institute or organization. And we are all, always, you know, very happy to help you out to connect you to the other institutes, other resource material, which you can actually look for. The other problem that arises, I would tell you, and that's again a very practical problem. When we carry out this kind of exercises, they are usually funded by external agencies. So, for example, the report that we are talking about, that's DST funded. So tomorrow I can do another similar project, which will be funded by MOEFCC. 
so these two documents in spite of being very close to each other will be hosted in a, in two different portals of two different ministries so uh, to be very honest it would be challenging to have a central place where you have all relevant information but yes if we can you know get hold of one institute then you can always you know get into touch with multiple of them so some effort has to be put together to thread the data is what you're yes. uh, what you're uh, what you're saying uh, dr rao any any uh, reflections on this topic mm -hmm. uh, this I is a question that has come up sir. several times I agree what dr das gupta has told actually there are actually now we are investing in data generation right so and people are asking for uh, to generate returns from investment data so yeah, as a government agencies also we are also forced to generate resources for our own for research funding so there are i think we need to uh, develop protocols uh, what kind of data at what to what detail can be shared so we cannot uh, re, uh, share all the raw data but in what form what kind of communication products uh, prepared out of the data can be shared we need to protocol and then second thing is that uh, not all data is actually usable by all the stakeholders if you talk about more sensing products actually that needs quite a bit of skill and understanding to how to use the data the data is based on it is wrongly used again actually it is maybe actually problematic also and as far as uh, our work is concerned actually i will share the link uh, we converted the, all this uh, report into a mobile app so that link i will share with you you can share with uh, what uh, that will be that will be wonderful that is exactly the yes, um, type of stuff i'll share and also hmm. this report is available uh, you can just google nicra n i c e r a so that will lead to the uh, project website uh, Uh, of which this project report is a part of. So, our technology options, whatever we are going to do, we are doing uh, for the last ten years, it is available in that website. Just Google to Nikra, N I C R A. So it, that will lead to that will yeah. lead to Nikra website. So there yeah. uh, some data on climate uh, technologies. Uh, we are working in hundred plus KVQs in the country. So all those reports are available. Uh, right, right. uh this is fantastic and i think we should take you up on this one final question i know we are f uh, seven minutes late but maybe one final question because that's so uh, is that we have already talked about uh, you know data is available at district level but for uh, things like high level some resolution data at the block level or village level you know are there any technologies like drone technologies or satellite technologies which any of you are working on uh So I just want to add uh, something onto this uh, because data, uh, particularly related to agriculture, is always a kind of uh, topic for debate since last few years in the ag tech community. I think uh, with a lot of pressure, uh, the government has started working on building national agri stack. Okay, so which what they are trying to do is basically they are creating an individual farmer identity. okay based on the satellite gis okay and they are also trying to uh, bring in private partners for that i think they have already signed a uh, few of the memorandum of understanding with large uh, it companies and also on the large agriculture players where uh, they are trying to create the use cases based on the data sets which is collected okay like for example pradhan mantri uh, your pm fbi so pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana is a great source of data aggregation there you are receiving farmer enrollment farmer data set land record climate data set in, in terms of observation okay and all that data is basically coming on to a kind of one single portal okay now i think uh, there are already some pilots have started coming up okay uh, to so that the agri tech or other researchers can start using that data to create certain uh, basically products or kind of applications around it which can directly be applicable to farming community okay and i think from our side uh, being a contributor from the private side uh, we have actually launched a platform called skygeo so in that platform uh, whatever data sets we have created in last 10 uh, 10 year you can say a decade in terms of satellite observation crop signatures certain raw data sets okay also on the uh, historical forecast what we have made our reports and all we actually made it public okay so people can come onto that platform uh, can uh, uh, request uh, they basically they just have to tell what kind of uh, data sets they require and we basically provide them okay to basically the idea is that 
the machine learning we understand but to do a machine learning you need a lot of data sets from where the new people will get it na so we are trying to support whatever we can do but from our side we actually trying to create a partnership with the governments where they can have a centralized database so this is fantastic uh, again i think we should take you up on that in, you know help propagate your website any final thoughts on sub district one more one second uh, yeah. there is another report uh, which you on the district level analysis hmm. so this is report is called uh, prioritization of wind areas uh, based on a multi dimensional composite index the report is available at the website of national wind area authority so that has lot of district level data the national red wind field authority area area yeah. authority yeah yeah i think that is also something that we would share with our audience any any final thoughts on lower than district block level using satellites using drones using new technologies anybody working in this area in india actually there is an organization called nbss in up national bureau of soil sciences and land use planning uh, they are working on uh, soil suitability for different crops they are using remote sensing data and working out uh, where uh, which side where the which part of the country are available is suitable to grow which crops but still that's not in the public domain but uh, based on the need they can uh, share that so okay. they are actually doing it to block level sub district level okay so we did have a couple of questions in that and i hope we have answered that so more or less i you know i know we have overspelled time but i, I you know i've been tracking the questions and i hope i have been able to summarize some of these questions together in in uh, um in this webinar uh i mean i to end this i guess i should thank first of all i should thank all our panelists uh, you know it's not easy to uh, to take your time off and come come here uh, uh but i really you know I, it was wonderful for me to host you and i 